I'm Laureate Johnson, third grade teacher here at Mount Carmel Christian. And about a year ago, my coworker Jolie Mayo introduced this book to me, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. And like others who have read the book, once I started, I couldn't put it down. Um, also like others, once I read it, I felt a burden to tell others about it. And so I told everyone I came in contact with about this story, but that just wasn't enough for me. I wanted to tell it to children, but I wanted children to tell it to each other. So I wrote a play um, and incorporated some music with the help of Jamie Renshaw. And we are here to tell the story of this one woman and how her cells have impacted the entire world. But this one woman, it's, it's not her story, it's hers and her family's and the sacrifices that they make together. So our hope is that you're able to learn something from it, um, enough that you go out to learn more about this great story. Thank you. Dear Henrietta, I never had the chance to meet you, so let me introduce myself. My name is Rebecca Skloot. Several years ago, I learned about you. Well, not really you, but a part of you. My teacher told me about yourself, the Gila self, but he didn't know anything about you. I made it my mission to learn about you. And I'm so glad that I did. I learned that you grew up very poor. As a matter of fact, to say you were poor is actually an understatement. You were the granddaughter of tobacco farmers, raised by your grandparents because of your own young mother's untimely death. You married young and had five children, but unfortunately, you didn't live long enough to see them grow up. But while you were here, you were such a caring and nurturing mother. You loved your children like no one else could. 
Another thing I learned is that you were hospitable. You were known for preparing delicious food for anyone who needed the comfort of a good old home-cooked meal. Miss Lax, I learned so much about you, I even wrote a book about you. Dear Henrietta, I remember the first time you came to my office for an appointment. I know you were scared, but I'm glad you came. You didn't trust us, us being doctors who sometimes treated you and others like second-class citizens just because you were black and poor. I could see how nervous you were, but I also remember how nice you were. That day is still etched in my memory. You came in complaining of a knot in your womb. I had never heard a patient describe their pain quite like that ever before. Anyway, that knot turned out to be probably the worst case of cervical cancer I'd ever seen. It took your life a little more than a year later, but not before it attacked several organs in your body. Your lungs, your kidneys, your intestines. It looked as if someone had filled your entire body with pearls, cancerous tumors that laced the inside of your body. It's hard to talk about the way you died, but what happened afterwards was nothing short of extraordinary. Doctors have learned so much from your cells, and we are eternally grateful for your sacrifice. Thank you, Henrietta. Dr. Howard Jones. Dear Henrietta, I have been trying for years, decades actually, to grow human cells and culture. Scientists around the world have been trying to accomplish this, but no one had ever succeeded. That was true until your cells entered my laboratory. Your cells, well, they were different. Not only did they grow, they grew like crazy. As a matter of fact, Mrs. Lax, they are still growing today. You can open just about any freezer any medical laboratory all over the world and find millions, maybe billions, of your cells. It's estimated that there are enough of your cells to wrap around the earth three whole times. Enough of your cells that if they're stacked on top of a scale, they'll weigh more than 50 million metric tons. Enough of your cells that they'll be more than 350 million feet long. It's quite ironic, really, because you yourself just stood five feet tall. More impressive than all of that are the scientific gains thanks to your immortal cells. I know you didn't know we were taking your cells, and I'm sorry no one ever asked your permission, but I'm thankful nonetheless. Your contribution to medical science have impacted us all. Thank you, Henrietta. Most sincerely, Dr. George Key. Dear Henrietta, without your cells, I may have not received the polio vaccine that keeps me and all of my friends free from polio. That crippling disease struck one of our teachers, Mrs. Royal, as a young girl. She was eight years old, just like me when that terrible disease kept her from being able to fully use one of her arms. She spent several weeks in a, in a special unit of the hospital, completely, completely full of children with polio. After all those weeks in the hospital, she spent months in the rehabilitation uh, in, in re Rehabilitation hospital. I can't imagine being away from my family for such a long time. But it was important for her to learn how to use her arm again. But to this day, she can only lift it but so high. I'm so thankful that I will never have to go through that, Mrs. Lex. Thank you for yourselves. With love.
Danielle Ingram. Dear Henrietta, when I was just two years old, my daddy was diagnosed with a rare cancer. He could have died. Without yourselves, my daddy may have not received the treatment that helped save his life. The doctors said his cancer wasn't curable, and I can't imagine life without my daddy, because he means so much to my family. But the same techno technology that was developed with your cells was used on my daddy's cells. They grew his cells in culture, harvested them, and then created a life-saving vaccine just for him. Life wouldn't be the same without my daddy. But today, my daddy is cancer-free, and he He's able to play with my sister and me, go on family vacations, and do all the things that a daddy should do. Thank you, Henrietta. Love, Anna Mayo. Dear Mama, life without you was hard, to say the least. I did the best I could for my brothers and sisters, but like most teenagers, I got restless. I wanted to be out in the pool halls hanging with the guys. I wasn't old enough to do that, so I lied about my age. I got a voter's registration when I was just 16. Well, lying to the government backfired on me and hurt my brothers and sisters most of all. I was drafted into the army, which left my brothers and sisters in the hands of Aunt Ethel. She never did mean them well. She was full of hatred and rage and my brothers and sisters were her victims. Life was hard on us all without you, especially Joe. But I'm not accept, upset about it anymore, Mama. In fact, I'm proud of you, Mama. And I guess my life didn't turn out half bad. I had a good woman by my side, and I'd done all right for myself. I just wish I could say the same for the rest. And I, But life has taught me not to hold into the past, and what I've heard about you, I suspect you didn't hold on to the past either. Everything I've ever been told about you was that you love to help, e help people. And with this cells, Mama, you did just that. I miss you, Mama. With love, Lawrence. Dear Mama, it's me, Elsie. I was different from the other children, you know, didn't talk like the others, didn't learn like them. And because I was different, when you got sick, they put me in that hospital, that institution. Nobody could take care of me like you could, Mama. And with you, I didn't need to talk. You knew what I was feeling. You, you had a way of looking into my eyes and seeing my soul. When I was with you, Life felt like running barefoot in a meadow in springtime. But without you, life felt like winter, darkness, silence. Dear Mama, I don't even know where to begin when I think about what I made out of my life, or better yet, what I didn't make out of my life. As a child, I stayed in trouble. Now, whether or not I did anything to deserve the trouble I was in, now that's a different story. Aunt Ethel didn't need a reason to beat any of us. Sometimes she just didn't like the fact that we were around. Believe it or not, sometimes I can still feel that extension cord that she used on me. One time she beat me with that thing so bad that I ended up in the hospital. I can still feel the burn. I don't really know if that's why I turned to drugs and hustling on the streets, robbing stores. I even robbed Lawrence's store once. <laughs> 